Hello, and welcome to Season 3 of Beyond Teaching, a series featured on the Psych Sessions Network. This series is hosted by Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University, Adyinka Akinsular smith from City College of New York, City University of New York, Asani Sewell from Pacific University, and yours truly, Eric Landrum from Boise State University. To be a successful psychology academic or professional, it takes more than teaching research or clinical skills. That is, today's professionals were probably not taught everything they need to know in graduate school. The Psych Sessions podcast, Beyond Teaching, strives to fill that gap. We chat about the topics we need to know about to be successful in our careers, but we didn't know to ask about in graduate school. When we don't have the expertise among us, we go out and find someone. And this is particularly relevant in Season 3. These 10 episodes were recorded from June 7th through November 2nd, 2021, and they are being released starting December 29th, 2021, and Season 3 will finish on March 30th, 2022. What are you in for? Oh, the places we'll go. We'll chat about leveraging social media, publications, and playing that classic academic game, how to make decisions about co-authoring, dealing with student requests for accommodations and exceptions, which seems especially relevant in this era, and maximizing student office hours, or what are called student hours these days. Also in Season 3, we invited a number of guests to come on the podcast and share their expertise with us. This included Sun Yung Lee in Saikai's Faculty Support Advisory Committee and what Saikai can do for faculty, Loretta McGregor and the difference between mentoring and advising, with extra information about imposter phenomenon tossed in for good measure. Sandy Jenkins and James Lane share their experience from two accumulated careers about clinical supervision. And Beatrice Krauss shares her delightful adventures in retirement, which depart greatly from our retirement stereotypes or typical tropes. We truly hope that you'll enjoy season three of Beyond Teaching. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Beyond Teaching. I think we're in season two. We're we're floating somewhere in season two. And I am with Eric Landrum, and maybe they're tired of introducing themselves. You can't see them on my screen, but I get to see them. I see I see Susan Nolan and I see Asani Sewell. Hi. Yinka Kinsular Smith. He got it right. Hello. (laughs) And you know what? I have it on my screen in that little font, but I think I've said it enough times where I can actually say it without looking at it. <laughs> so we're uh, going to talk about office hours slash student hours and the ways in which we convince students that we're here for them and we want to see them. I know we're beyond teaching and this is related to teaching, but it's a separate part of it. So maybe we can... This is beyond teaching, sure. It's beyond teaching. Maybe we can start by talking about um, just briefly each of our models for how we do student slash office hours. Who wants to start? Let's go to Asani because I know she's got a heavy teaching load this semester. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Dr. I'm on sabbatical. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Professor sabbatical. Yeah, I don't do office hours, actually. On my syllabus, what I have is by appointment because the thing that I have found, I teach only graduate students. These are clinical psychology students. Once they get beyond their first year and now they're doing their clinical work, it's the office hour thing just doesn't work so well. You can't find a time that anyone can actually show up. So it's really by appointment. And I provide my email address for folks to get in touch with me and I encourage them to do so to make an appointment. And for those students that I either supervise clinically or supervise dissertations or things like that, they have my email address, but they also have my cell phone number. That's important for students that are supervising clinically, obviously, that they can like call you about a client or whatever. And they can text and get an appointment too. And that's just the way that I kind of do it. So there are a couple of faculty in my department who do office hours. They just seem to be sitting there. I never see these students just like coming into their office, honestly, because when would be a time that all students could actually be able to come to an office hour? 
in this context. So mine is just by appointment. And I don't do anything fancy with that. It's just an email and then we're back and forth and that can get a little bit annoying, but we figure it out. And, and that's how I do it. Sonny, your colleague's model, there's a name for that. It's called the Maytag Repairman model. Oh. Now, are, are any of our I listeners are going to get that model, but w- watch it, Google it on YouTube. And you'll- I love that. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> is that the, from the old ads where the, and I know these man repairman. The old ads, the Maytag repairman had nothing to do because the Maytag never broke. They were so reliable as dishwashers that in the ah uh, yeah, everyone ever walked in. So that was the gag. Mm-hmm. Those are my colleagues who are like constantly like getting coffee in the break room or like heating up a muffin. I'm like, what? I, I don't understand what's going on. There's just nothing to do. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think the people who have used traditional office hours you just hit it right on the head. They do it 4 to 6 p.m. Tuesday, Thursday, when it's convenient right. for a faculty member and not for the students. And so that's why I think it, I, I kind of have a preview of how all three of you do it. And you've made it so that it's more focused on the student, which really makes a big difference. So I plead guilty to being rather traditional. I call them student hours, which is something I learned a couple of years ago from some STP folks. I wish I could remember from whom. So I could credit them, but I did, I did that to try and make it clearer that these are are for the students. And I, I learned over time that the students don't always understand office hours. Oh, well, though you're in your office, you must be busy. So yeah, I did rebrand my office hours. I'm required to hold in-person office hours per my, I'm contractually required, three, three hours a week. So I do, and I have them, I do currently, I'm a Monday, Wednesday teaching person and I do two hours on Monday and one hour on Wednesday and I do them in between my classes. So with the hopes that at least a lot of the students will have some time before or after their class. And I also do them by appointments and I do regularly tell my students if they say, can I meet with you? And I say, yeah, can you come to office hours? And if not, I I, I automatically say this. I don't just say, can you come to office hours? I automatically say, and if not, can you let me know some days and times that might work for you? But I do routinely get students to come to. And, and, and this semester, I'm in person. Last year, I was not, so everything was virtual. But I, I offered to the students to do virtual or in person. And I would say 95% of students are coming virtually. And it's great. We can share screens. I think it's great. So I, I wonder, do more of them come? Because it's a little bit easier to mm. start a chat. And then I'm probably shocked when I start a video chat. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty traditional. That's our model. Yeah, and, and Eric, what are your models? Well, for me, well, inspired by you in this program, I've now shifted from calling them office hours to student hours. Thank you very much. And it's pretty traditional. I give, I have the office hour schedule. I'm not, I, I, not aware of us being contractually obligated to do a certain amount, but I have the hours that are set, and then I also have by appointment. So if people can't make those hours. They email me or we try to set something up or they hit me up after class or before class. I try to make myself available. Yeah. Yeah, the before and after class, I think, is important. Trying to get to class early and then lingering a bit late. I I take my time packing up because I often find that once most people clear out, there's a student or two who are lingering around. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. So we're a commuter campus, so it's really difficult to find a a common convenient time for students. And so I have one class this semester of 80 students face-to-face and another class of 160 students online. So it's really difficult to find a a time convenient for a three-hour time block, three hours of office hours. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that model other than here in Boise State, students just don't use it. I was the Maytag repairman for... I don't know, 25 years, 20 years where I I would go an entire semester and maybe see four students in 16 weeks of office hours. I got a lot of work done. I probably got some publications out of that, quite frankly. But, But what I switched to, I don't know, in the past four or five years is online scheduling software called You Can Book Me. There's also Calendi. There's a bunch of them. I think maybe 
Google Calendar has its own version now. I just happen to like, you can book me. I don't use the free version. I use the one that's $10 a month. I started paying for it myself. And then the department took it over when there was a new department chair. And for people who don't get the joke, that was me when I became a department <laughs> chair. <laughs> nice. So, uh, um, and it's nice because I can define, students can kind of see the gaps in my Google Calendar. Actually, I'll just tell you, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays of any week during the semester. And when there's a half hour gap or more, they can pop them, themselves in. And I have a predefined form that asks them their name, their student ID number, why do they want to see me, uh, a place that they could upload something like an assignment they want me to look at or a CV or a resume they want me to look at ahead of time. They can pick, do you want face-to-face -face or online? And they can submit that. And that, <laughs> and so I, it pops, it auto-populates on my calendar. It auto-populates on their calendar. And they get a reminder one hour before saying, you have an appointment yeah. with Dr. Landrum in one hour. And so very, I very nice. get a lot less no-shows that way. Yeah. And I don't have to do the back and forth. I'm not available at 4 on Thursday. Are you available at 4.30? No, I'm not. A, I don't have to do 16 back and forths yeah. to find one time. Mm -hmm. They get the convenience of seeing when I am available. And I can block out when I don't want to be available. So I'm just going to push back a tiny bit because my when I do advising, so at, at Seton Hall, unlike when Asani was a student, when we had designated advisors and I was one of two designated advisors for everybody. And that was a nightmare because not because it wasn't lovely, but because there were so many of you. Now we all take our, our share of advise, advisees and I've got, you know, in any given semester, 40 to 50 advisees, and we've got about three weeks to see them all. So for that, I started out by doing a scheduling system a number of years back. And I would get so many no-shows. So I, I, li I like that your system reminds them. I'm a little bit worried about that. So what I started doing is I, in addition to my office hours, which I reserve, my student hours, which I reserve for students in my current classes, I have, I set up a whole bunch of advising hours. I just make them first come, first serve, and I just hang around. And I like that better for a couple of reasons. One is I, whoever shows up, and you don't have to worry about like, oh, all right, prepare for this half hour block and somebody doesn't come. And also sometimes it doesn't take long. Sometimes I have a student who's super together and is like, I, I don't have any career questions right now. I Here's my schedule for next semester. We look through and like, that's perfect. Did you have any questions? It's done in like five minutes. Mm -hmm. And other times it's somebody who's really, things are complicated. They've just transferred a happy situation. They realize they have a bunch of open credits and let's talk about different minors and what they might do with that. So, and that can take 45 minutes or an hour. And so for me, it works really nicely to have this, like I have over the, it's, it's starting tomorrow as my first set of advising hours. And over the next three weeks, I've got chunks, two hours, three hours, four hours over the different days. And it, it ends up sort of working. And then if a student writes to me and they say, I'm ready, I can give them an estimate. Like, okay, I'm with someone now, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. So I don't know. I'm, it's not very high tech. <laughs> hey, first off, if it works, it works. Secondly, in you can book me, you can put out their different lengths of appointments, different types. That's assuming the students know how much time they're going to need. Yeah, but you can say, yeah, do you want, let's talk, let's chat for 30 minutes. Let's chat for 15. Let's chat for 45. But you're also assuming that, hey, I'll be done in 10 minutes and they'll actually be there. So you're making some assumptions too. The other thing, and I don't use this on You Can Book Me, I pay the 10 bucks a month, but you can even upgrade beyond that. You can upgrade to a chat, sorry, a text message reminder. I, I rely on the email reminder. And I think if you are really concerned about no shows, you can buy credits to where you can have text messages sent at reminders. And I guess that I, I would almost guess that would cut down on your no shows even more. How about they have to pay me if they don't come? Uh, actually, there is a... That's so skin in the game. <laughs> well, actually, I, I think You Can Book Me is also used by therapists. As, I was thinking... As a, mm -hmm. yeah. There is yep. a monetary yeah. tool on there. I don't use it, obviously, but you can use it to collect... How about $50? How about just... I mean, that. we have on our student... Our, not student our faculty and student IDs, they're, we're the pirates at Seton Hall, and, and you can load money on it. It's pirate gold, they call it. And you can oh, it our pirate gold. Fully <laughs> our, yeah, you can use it in the vending machine. I think maybe the equivalent of a Coke Zero if you blow me off. <laughs> at least. <laughs>
or $5 to reserve your time with Dr. Nolan. <laughs> and it's refunded when you show up on time. And it's forwarded if you blow her off. Restaurants are starting to do that. Yeah, no show fee. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually, with restaurants, I am fine with that. Because, I yeah. Well, they're trying to recoup. That's right. Pirate dollars. Pirate, pirate, pirate gold, Eric. Pirate gold, maybe. <laughs> pirate gold. <laughs> pirate gold, she said. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, I, it's, I'm just, actually, it's Halloween, right? So. I am super intrigued by... Yes, and it's for everybody, just so they know, Eric is in costume today. <laughs> On the 1st of November, we dance. Yes, we're, we're dating ourselves. We're the day after Halloween. No, actually, I'm just dating be, myself for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> to be quite serious, I, I am intrigued by the you can book me model. And I know that some of my colleagues at Seton Hall use it and like it very much. So you have convinced me to at least check it out. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. It, it happens to work for me right now. That's all. Mm -hmm. How do we get them to come? Any tips? I think the rebranding as student hours. And I also think the bringing it up over and over. That's what I do. Very uh, boring. But I, I, I maybe some more creative ways. Yinka, you seem to. I haven't done this, but I have long thought, like maybe some incentive, like I don't know, an extra few points. I get to know you better. You get to know me better. Here are not, I don't know, not five extra credit points, but something that gives them incentive to just come and talk. Oh, I love that. I actually do not quite that, but in my large classes, I have an extra credit, which is a point added to your whole grade, grade for the whole semester. It's very bribey. If you send me an article connecting something in the news to our class and you write a paragraph, it, oh, like but you have to email it to me, <laughs> not upload it on Blackboard. You have to write me an email mm, mm. and send it to me. And they come over the course of the semester. So even if there's 120 students, not everyone does it, although I would say three, three quarters do. And when it comes in, then I get to engage with them. I get to write back and say, this was such a cool article. I loved that you connected it in this way. And sometimes I have a question for them. And it's like, it forces them. Oh, that, I like that idea. But I love your idea, Yanka, but of having a similar thing for coming. You have to bring me a piece of paper in my student hours if you want that <laughs> and then you get a little point and you can make an appointment if my student hours don't work but you cannot be at the beginning or end of class you have to come find me yeah what about the distressed email that you send now this is only impactful i think for certain students in certain programs so like my clinical program which is on the smaller medium side side of things if the student doesn't show i'll send an email out or were you I was waiting for you. I was here. I was did something. And you sort of <laughs> send this whole I'm worried distressing email where it's just like I was waiting and I was alone and it was dark and he <laughs> didn't show up. The parenting email. Where were you? <laughs> there were spiders dropping from the That's the what you're sending or they're sending. No, well, that's what I'm sending when they don't show up for their appointment with me. I will send an email and just sort of say, I thought we had an appointment. Was I yeah. wrong? Yeah. Or if I, I have their phone number, number, I will text them. Aggressive? I will text them and say, I, I thought we had an appointment. It's did like 10 after now. But well, also, you know, it's a very clinical thing because it's also like with <laughs> clinical students modeling what you do with clients when they don't show. Yeah, there you go. You let them be or do you remind them of having that? Yeah. And <laughs> after three no-shows, you say you're fired. <laughs> I take that by you. Run the magic number. I don't, I don't live in the clinical world. Three no-shows and you're fired? Depends on the program and, yeah. and, and the, the setting. And I take back the whole you're fired thing because it's just bringing back images that I really don't want <laughs> and memories that I don't want. Okay. Well, if you're getting blown off a lot, clearly that's a problem and it's damn disrespectful. And obviously when a grad school, I've never taught graduate students, so I really can't speak to anything. It's also the therapy thing too. I think Yinka and Asani right now are referring to a therapist client relationship. And that's different. And actually having some kind of a boundary there is, mm. I think, even more important than the kinds of I think if, if a student keeps making appointments with us and blowing us off, that's, that's problematic. That's, yeah. But I think the client therapist situation is another ballgame. Asani, would that be your literal strategy to to 
send that email or would it be just to say nothing and do nothing and the next time that student asks for something you don't respond oh no i don't do that i yeah yeah i usually reach out with the email and just i thought we had an appointment i was expecting you that's usually what i do yeah yeah and i would guess the student even wouldn't put that together Right. You didn't respond. They wouldn't even That's like the or, and they would be like together. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a teachable moment. You got to teach. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I find, though, that most students who make appointments, um, at, at least the ones from my classes, as opposed to the advisees who blow me off a lot. But the ones from my classes, if they make an appointment, they they do tend to come. Agreed. Yeah, I don't think I get blown off out of forgetfulness. I get blown off out of something happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a car tire blew, a uh, car wouldn't start, roommate wouldn't give me a ride to campus. Especially yeah. if they've gone through the trouble to make the appointment with you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they got to go to a website. They got to fill out an online yeah. form. Yeah. Or even with all of you going back and forth with emails and arranging it, that's effort. That's energy. Yeah, although I, I I don't find I go back and forth very much. If a student can't make my office hours, uh, I just say, can you let me know all your available times over the next week? And then I'm- Oh, if they work. can't. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, actually you're making it very convenient with student hours. You just drop right. it unannounced. Or start a chat and we'll do a video call. Or if you can't make it, I'll say to them, tell me all your available times for the next week. Oh, and they can start a chat. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's very cool. But I don't say, when do you want to meet? Because then they'll be like, four on Tuesday and I can't. Mm -hmm. So I'll just say, give me all your open times for this week. Right. And Smart. then I will look at it and pick one that works. Mm -hmm. for or sometimes I'm nicer and I'll pick four that would work for me and let them pick. But mm -hmm. and, you, and Susan, you just said something that prompted me about something. And I don't know if students will ever listen to this, but it, I, and and. Maybe you're all, actually, I, I'm confident you're all. I hope they do. And if you're listening, students, please come to your student hours for your professors. We want to see you. But I, but it reminds me of this. At least for me, students' attitude towards asking for help can make all the difference in the world for me in helping that student. Meaning, if a student's in my class and asks for help and they have a crappy attitude, I'm going to help them. They're my student. It's my job. But if a student is sincere and really seems like they want help and they want to learn, I will do the same type of thing to help that student as the first one, but then I will probably bend over backwards, meaning I'll find extra time or I'll do it at a time yeah. convenient for me. I, when a student has that attitude, it goes a long way. Yes. This is a fun conversation well, great. and I have a lot of good new ideas and I appreciate as always the different and sometimes overlapping, sometimes not viewpoints in this great fun group. Thank We're you. a good team. Yeah. Cool.